Falcon Heavy is configured for flight. Let's get ready to All right, what's going on, everyone? My name is Kyle. As always, it's the Black Tees and Engineering Podcast. I have a special guest with me today, and I uh, didn't even end to explain to him what the name of the podcast meant or anything, so I'm going to give a quick rundown on that. But we have Dr. Woost with us here today. Did I pronounce that right? That was totally correct. That's always my number one question because I always get it wrong. And I'll catch <laughs> shit for it afterwards. But anyways, um, we have Dr. Woost for us here today, and the Black Tees and Engineering Podcast, the mindset and the piece to it is Black Tees being casual, engineering talk. That's the idea here, and that's why we brought you on, because I took a look at your resume, and you have a lot of interesting stuff going on, and I've visited, you know, just throughout the research department and talked to different people, and they say you're the guy for this. All right, that sounds good. Let's see. <laughs> right, right. We'll see. So 2018, what did you expect to be where you are today in 2018 in a field where, I guess let me set this up, in a field where technology is, is at the helm of 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 our of the bottleneck and capacity of where we can go, right, in these manufacturing centers? Like, it's pretty much, there's no ceiling if we can get the technology right? Well, as an academic, I probably have to disagree. There's always a ceiling, but in general, it's a very exciting time that we're in right now because technology made leaps uh, forward and it's now in our hands and now it's yeah, what we do with it. And uh, all of a sudden we can do things that were envisioned 20 years back, but very impossible to do because of connectivity, sensors too big, too expensive, uh, battery power not available. Now it is. You can buy it on Amazon for like 10 bucks, uh, yeah, right. $20 an Arduino right. Nano and you're good. What did you think you were going to be doing when you were in college? Well, I want to be a consultant. I want to work for McKinsey or Boston Consulting Group. Ah, okay, okay. And now you're a professor here at West Virginia University. Yeah, that changed a little bit, right? Changed a little bit. <laughs> so what are some of the what are some of the pieces or that deflected you and sent you on a different trajectory here? What interested you to make you want to do something like this in the first place? Well, during my studies, I wanted to be a consultant because I wanted to work with talented colleagues in a high-paced environment, learn a lot. Um, then after my second master's in business, um, I had a chance to work for Arthur D. Little in Switzerland as a consultant and really loved it for the first four months. Uh, it was, a, as I said, high paced environment. The colleagues were awesome. We worked 14 hour days in average. Um, I, of course, all the consultants had an Excel table where I put my hours in. They were not, we didn't charge for it, but it was yeah, 14 hours a day in average. Right, so a and, lot of work. Yeah, and that one day it was, uh, we had a big presentation to the C-level customers and the uh, project manager said like, oh, let's call it a day early. So we called it a day early, eight o'clock at night, went home and uh, went to, I, I lived with roommates back then because uh, I worked where, uh, I lived where the project was settled, not in a hotel. Uh, and they had a barbecue. We sat outside, I had two beers, a steak, and thought, wow, that's like weekend. And then I thought like, wait a second, the customer always leaves at five. I could have that every day. And then I reflected a little <laughs> bit more critically and thought like, what do we do there? We, you do a lot of work, you have a high pressure environment, um, but it's not rocket science. It's basically just not making mistakes, do a lot of work and communicate good with people. But it has been done before. You use tools that you use in other projects, your lessons learned from other companies and bring it together, which is clearly challenging and, and uh, has a clear benefit to the customer and yourself. But um, you're kind of guided by, by outside factors. And that's when I thought, of, oh, maybe I want to do something more independent where I can steer a little bit where I want to go. And I guess that was the first, uh, yeah, where it derived from my original trail. Right, because what you were doing at the time, you were kind of being controlled by, I don't want to say the system, it sounds too anti-system, but you were, <laughs> yeah, you, were man, you were kind yeah. of, yeah, the, the man, <laughs> but you were kind of being navigated in a weird way by industry and like just what's going on and stuff yeah, like that. I mean, that. it's clearly needed that you improve the process. I mean, industrial engineers, that's what it's all about, like improve the process, uh, make use of what you have, your tools, apply them to, to challenging problems, solve them, and, and move on. Right. How old were you at this point when you actually thought of this and you were like, oh, geez, like, I'm kind of caught up in it? That was two, 10 years ago, 2008. Actually. 2008. Yeah. And how, how, how old were you at the time? So, okay, so I, I can't get yourself. around I'm that right to, now. I know, I saw that. I was that. 25, 26. Yeah. Okay, 25, 26. Yeah. Okay. So, just finished my master's programs and so before the PhD. Right, and you're just like light bulb moment. Maybe this isn't what I exactly I wanted to move towards. Yeah, it, it just started uh, because when you're when you're in that environment, you work with your colleagues, you work with these people all the time. They do the same thing you do. You don't question that you sit in the office till eleven or twelve at night because it's normal. And after you go for a beer with the same colleagues and you talk about 
the stuff you talk about. Like it's and they're great guys. They're really fun to be with. Be with. You don't don't miss anything. Right, right. No, that's fascinating because yeah, because right now I've I've done several rotations and several internships with a consulting group, and I just keep I've, I've had a sim- I have a similar mindset to kind of what you described. I'm like, yeah, like I want to go work for a consulting group and mm. do this and do that, and I've already kind of seen. Oh my god! Hopefully, McKinsey and the others will not hire a hitman or something. I mean, when I when I <laughs> disappear, you know who it was. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a valid thought. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so you said that. You said, okay, this maybe isn't for me. And then you moved towards uh, consciously thinking that you wanted to pursue a master's. Is that the idea? Or you no, already, I already had a master's? Had, I had two masters. A master's in industrial engineering and a master's in business. When you went into consulting, you already had those? Well, the master's in business was finalized. And after the consulting internship, I finished my master's thesis and was done with the industrial engineering master's. Okay, okay. So what was the step after you made the, had this thought then? What was the next move? Well, during the master's thesis, which I did also with a company, Tyson Krupp, uh, which was more like a, a machine builder. They built furnaces. And right. So I did, did that uh, in their research facility. And um, the academic in, in Bremen, like my, my advisor, um, right. he afterwards asked me if I want to stay on for a PhD. And... Uh, I explored a little bit what, what I wanted to do, looked at the U.S. and some other markets and some companies like Siemens graduate programs and so on. Um, and in the end, I, it was the best offer because I thought, okay, let's try the academic freedom a little bit, but still with a clear intention of going back into industry. Cause in, in Germany? In Germany, it's a little bit different because when you look at the CEOs of most Siemens and all the uh, ThyssenKrupp and the uh, Bosch, the other technical companies, most of the CEOs or C-level managers have a PhD. Right. Okay. Okay. So, well, how does that compare to the U.S. Then, a lot of these managers don't have a PhD, right? A lot of them work their way up. Surprisingly, a lot of them do, but uh, okay. they don't advertise it as they do in in Europe or Austria, where where the the title is part of your name, kind of more. Is here, it, here it's more casual. Oh, okay. So I've actually ran this a few times. Is it is it possibly that? Just people in other countries respect those titles more than they do here, and that's why they feel the need to tag I, it I on. I don't necessarily think it's kind of a respect, but um, and I I don't know the the philosophical reason behind it, but uh, you can put it basically in your passport. It's part like it's part of your name after you yeah. wrote that. Uh, yeah. So and and you put it in front of your name. It's not like blah blah PhD, but it's professor, doctor, yeah, Wüst, for example. And that's how people address you. So, right. Okay. Um, and I guess in uh, these German companies are mostly technology focused, so it's it's yeah accepted that the PhD is more applied and and uh, utilized in in that. Right, right. As if they couldn't tell already, I was going to make sure we worked the Germany <laughs> por- portion into this, and I have some more <laughs> questions about that coming down the road here. But um, yeah, Maybe, German yeah. engineering. It's as if they go hand in hand, right? Yeah, I guess uh, I guess that reputation helps, um, and and I mean they they. So far, did a good job until VW. Uh, oh, probably, that was on yeah. the list. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got yeah. you. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's definitely a positive uh, thought of consciousness. You know what I mean? Like, at least when I think of engineering, I think of German is like one of the words I associate with it. Just because I, of I guess it's, it's like uh, in the in the DNA of the country, they see themselves as a manufacturing country and tra- take uh, great pride in it. And I think a big difference, for example, to to other systems like the UK for example where there's a clear division between blue color and white color right uh, in Germany it's more like uh, the, the the engineer or the manager will take advice from the guy at the shop floor because they know their job best they're the experts on that system so you ask them for advice you don't tell them what they need to do because that's not your job so it's it's a uh, it's mutual respect because you see the expertise and and uh, the well-educated shop floor worker knows that system very well and can advise the engineer and say like hey you should probably think about this and then yeah and wow really for a good product in okay the end, yeah. I, I just through just for hearing you explain that um yeah i feel like that's a, a similar or i've heard a similar um methodology in in japan of yeah. through like yeah through just the, the worker being like you know what i mean being able to suggest things and then respecting it and seeing them as the master of that environment exactly which makes yeah. perfect sense yeah. okay so um Let's go back to when you switch over to university, right? Switch over to university. Was the thought process that you were going to start working on the cutting edge of things in general? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, during the PhD, of course, I'm always involved in conferences and other, talking to other academics and companies and, and the, the people in the companies who can make decisions uh, which yeah impact their future a few years down the line. Um, and, of course, you can explore stuff that might not directly make economic sense. Uh, but you see... Uh, 
potential in the future. So, so you have a chance to, yeah, like what we talked about, the AR classes, for example, it's something in a company, I would probably not recommend it right now to directly jump into that because it, right now it's a learning process. Right. But we can do that because we can just order them and say like, oh yeah, well, customer service is not there because it's brand new, but a company that would be bad. But for us, it's like, okay, we figure it out. And right, uh, right. It's new and it's, it's exciting. And just for everyone listening in here, like I, this is so fascinating because I had no idea probably until two years ago, my sophomore, junior year, I had no idea what research even meant. Like I was clueless. I would call it ignorance, call it whatever it is, just not understanding the system and how it works. But I think a lot of these kids or people don't have any idea what it means. I truly think, and I don't think professors think of this when they're in school or here at at the university, but I really think that the majority of the people who walk by your office or in your classroom really have no idea what research even means. Like the fundamentals of it. Like they, if you ask them to give, to give them a a real description of it, like, why do we do research here? What's the point? I guarantee three quarters of the kids in the class can't answer the question. Cause I think it's just, there's a gap somewhere where no one explains it to them or they think it's assumed or something like that. But most of these people, I don't think have any idea. And including myself, like I just said a year ago, I had no idea until I just started asking questions. And I was like, wait, you mean the things out in the world that are on like the most, you know, frontier, on the frontier, the things that are, that people find so cool that we look up online and we're like, oh wait, AR, like AR glasses, like I'm sitting here playing with things in the air, you know what I mean, that type of stuff. That's what research is about. It's about breaking down these fundamental things so they can use it in the technology. And, and when I found that out, that's when I was like, oh, I'm stopping in all these offices. And I like, st- you know what I mean? Then you start yeah. going around these, uh, offices down here and you're like wow they're working on just stuff that actually does break that you know the breakthrough that leads to these items yeah okay so you mean there's a, a certain disconnect in in the perception of what what a university is about yeah right right so in a weird way the university that's how a university like is in business and thrives in a way right or that's what what they want to be known for is these research groups and, and things at stuff least a like research university yeah. yeah at least a research university I, and i guess i'm not educated enough to even say what that exactly you know what these focuses are but yeah that um so Actually, the, just to, to chime in here yeah. i had a, a visiting re- a professor from germany here right now uh, last last week actually i think i saw um, that yeah and he actually um his group always posts facebook videos each like they call it what's uh, worker wednesday uh, or something. So they introduced Worker one of their, Wednesday? Yeah, one of their, their researchers of the group and they explain in one minute videos on Facebook what they do. So to, to connect the students, because the students always see professors in the classroom or for exams and, and that's the extent of it. But that's just a small portion of what we really do and what we're here for. Yeah. That's a great point. Because I think that, like I said, I until last year, I didn't even know. Like, I didn't realize like some of these professors are here because they're interested in, re- like, it went right <laughs> over my head. I, you know, as dumb as that is, it's like, oh, it's like I should have seen that coming. You know what I mean? But yeah, so um, what are some of the, like, the research things that you're doing or that you're interested in or, or whatever? Because you just mentioned AR glasses and stuff like that. But um, maybe help us see the full picture because a lot of times we hear a word that someone's doing in research and it sounds overly complicated and you know uh, heavy and bureaucratic type of a word like industry like 4.0, you know what I mean? IoT 4.0, just different things in general. And uh, people don't make the connection. They can't, they don't see it. So, okay, uh, yeah, probably so could go on for, for the rest start of it. Start with, start <laughs> I know, this is where it came, to, it, it struck me, wow, bringing professors in to talk is perfect. Like, the, people talk for days on this stuff. <laughs> I'll, so, I'll yeah, let's start, with, short, I'll start yeah. with, let's start with one thing that you're fascinated and that you're interested, yeah. or you've been I think in. what sums it up pretty much is, is smart manufacturing, and, and I will elaborate just a little bit on that. Um, what, what I mean by that is, um, it's basically the, the connection uh, connectivity between the life cycle phases so it's not just manufacturing but the smart is i think the the essential part yeah so break that down th- life cycle <laughs> phases i know i know like we're both ie based here but a lot a lot of people aren't yeah so what i mean with life cycle phases is that view that you have the beginning of life of a product where right. you have the design the manufacturing the pricing and so on and then the middle of life where the product is used that can be in a business environment like a industry like a machine tool or something but it could be your car or your iPhone. Right. And then you have the end of life, where basically the end of the useful life of that product ended, your car crashed, or your iPhone is, the new one came out, you don't like the old one anymore. You got the crappy iPhone, all your friends have the 10, they're pulling it out, and you're exactly. like, I need to get rid of this device. That's that's the point, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so there's the, the planned obsolescence, like when, when some companies, when their business model is based on, okay, the washing machine broke, we have to buy a new one. That's how the company, like I, let's call them Kenmore, Earns their money, okay? okay. Don't want to disc more just to pick the random name. No, no, random name. But wait, let me let me break off for half a second. We'll jump right back into that. Do companies just quick answer? Do companies build 
um, defects into their product, or not defects, but kind of, kind of build yeah. defectiveness into their product. So, so they, ma- so I don't want to say so they make more money, no, but no, so that's, that that's exactly so there people have to buy more of their product or buy yeah. additional pieces for yeah, it. Yeah, no, no, very simply, yes. There's a name for it. It's called planned obsolescence, and it's basically the, your plan that your product lasts that long. I mean, look at your printers. You have here a HP or whatever. Yeah. Well, they, these uh, these printer cartridges are freaking expensive. As he looks in the corner, and there's a 1980s <laughs> printer sitting there. <laughs> that probably doesn't have that system. But the new <laughs> systems, the printers are dirt cheap. They probably sell it with a loss or, or just break even. But the cartridges are very advanced. And a lot of them have chips in them now. And they count how many pages you print. So they are guaranteed for 1,000 pages. And after 1,000 pages, there might be 80% of the, the ink still in there. They will not print anymore. So you buy the new one. All right? And, and the reason is, yes, they are sales-based business models, so they, they will earn money when they sell you a product. The same with the washing machine. When it breaks, you have to buy a new one because it's, it's not feasible to repair it anymore. These guys, let me tell you. <laughs> Jeez, man, and really? Then, actually, the class I'm teaching tonight is the product service system that tries to, to move into that section and try to establish a new business model. Companies will always want to earn money. That's their reason for being. Yeah, to earn right, money. Of course, of course. Of course. Um, and and uh, but how can we, we help them earn money but still be environmentally responsible. Like to say, okay, can we disconnect um, basically the, the revenue model from consuming resources? And product service system is kind of like that because all of a sudden you have more like a subscription model, like your Netflix. You don't buy DVDs anymore, but you buy a monthly fee and you have access to, to what you need. In a weird way, could you say that's a more morally sound business model? Like you're building something to the best of your ability in, in giving a subscription based on it rather than building something and planning for it to fail in five years? I, that might I, be I a would, bad I way to look keep, at it. I would keep morality out of it because that's a very philosophical thing and I, 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 I would not go that far, but I think it's a more sustainable business model because you, you provide the company with the means to, to earn a living, basically, and the customer gets a better satisfaction of their needs because when you think of it, um, let's go back to the washing machine. It's a good, good example. Right. Uh, in the end, what you want is clean clothes. You don't care how they're clean. You, you just don't want to have a problem. You don't want to have a flooded apartment. You don't want to worry about in the ideal But world. I also don't want to buy a new washing machine after five years. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's what, I, what I'm saying. Like you, You're not interested in buying a washing machine, owning it. It doesn't matter. You won't brag to your friends that you Are you talking about the pros machine. of the of the subscription-based model? Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Yeah. right. Or, or the transition, like just how, how the customer would benefit or the user would benefit from it. And in the, in the end... Right now, when you buy a washing machine, you are responsible for the energy it put in because you plug it in, you pay your, your energy bill. Right. You pay your, um, what is it, detergent, right? Yeah. But in the end, you don't care about that. It's just additional annoying stuff that you have to take care of. In the end, you want clean clothes. When a company would be able to provide you with that and they provide the washing machine, all of a sudden they have an interest of having low maintenance because they would be responsible for maintaining it. They would be responsible for paying for the parts. They would be responsible for the increased energy that it needs when they are not building it efficiently. Right. So it might be, or it is, um, in the end, they would invest more in building this thing using better materials, using more design uh, resources to, to build it really nicely so it won't fail because then they earn more money. When it runs without any problem for 10 years, then they break even. I think this makes way more sense on a on a yeah both sides of the of you know what I mean the yeah. consumer. But and it's the, still a transition. This business model switch is very hard for companies when they are in this traditional. Oh, we build something, sell it, and then we are disconnected. Right. Because right. all of a sudden you can collect data how the user uses the washing machine, phase it back in, and use it for design to build an even better next generation model. Okay. Okay. This makes sense. And I know we totally segued there. Okay. But smart, <laughs> yeah. but smart. It's just what I'm interested in. But so no, back but that's to the, the core of it. Like yeah. it's, it's a very interconnected. You see, I talked about business models, right. which is probably, you would say, oh, that should be in the business school. And yeah. That's it, why these things I think connected. are so complex to explain to some people, because once you, you start into one subject, right? Like smart manufacturing, and then you have to explain this other subject that goes like 50 layers deep in this other subject, just to make it all really, truly make sense. But back to what you were saying about smart manufacturing in general, and that's been your area of research. Um, that's where I think I'll let you go ahead with it. But man, this is where it gets real fascinating. People, if they understood more of this, what you're about to describe, they'd be like, I'm going, I'm going industrial engineering or I'm going mechanical or something that builds towards this progress. Cause I'll tell you what, it is cool, but go ahead back to what you're saying. I think we stopped part way. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let me backtrack a little bit, but, uh, you said I want to study industrial engineering. I think with smart manufacturing, 
you don't have to study industrial engineering. I mean, it would be good to do because it's a really cool major. Okay. But uh, <laughs> mechanical, <laughs> computer science, business, they all come into play. Like you can't do it. It's not a, a single discipline uh, topic. Okay. That's a, by nature. I do think of it as a, like, do the other, these, do these other majors talk about it? I'm not oh, in yeah, classes. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in, the, in the lane department, they, they work on IoT devices, connectivity of sensors, batteries. Uh, and you and you need that to Which enable smart manufacturing. Without that, it won't work. You have the the apps that basically visualize it, the AR classes. You have uh, uh, pattern recognition where you develop advanced algorithm, and all that comes in as as pieces of this bigger picture smart manufacturing on the shop floor and beyond. Now this makes perfect sense. That goes back to like they might. Do you think they would understand the word if I said smart manufacturing to them, or they understand the IoT portion and and they're kind of disconnected from what it. Yeah, uh, that that probably because IoT can also right. be done in, in in smart infrastructure in in buildings. I and, get what you're yeah. saying now. You're saying yeah, you're saying that it's all part it's of the puzzle. Yeah, it's like the idea is if I take my phone apart, we can pick apart ten engineering majors that were part of it. That's the idea. Yeah, and and in smart manufacturing, because IoT, uh, the industrial Internet of Things, is a little bit different from the the typical IoT what we what we basically have in our pockets. Right. Um, because you have increased uh, yeah requirements towards. Uh, data security, uh, con uh, connectivity, like you cannot, uh, the, the, it cannot fail because otherwise you lose a lot of money in your, your manufacturing environment. Um, the, the cyber security aspects are important, the latency, like as of, you need to, con uh, the data needs to be at the machine for real time control within a certain very small uh, fraction of a, of a second. Yeah, of course, um, or else your whole line's getting messed up or yeah, whatever it is or that your you're product, running. Because, or your product, because yep. when you want to, for example, the real-time control, when you observe the quality of a data in real time and want to adapt your process um, according to what you just analyzed, right. that needs to be done really, really fast, right? Right, so let's paint that picture real quick. So we didn't even talk about that, but like, what's the world look like now compared to what it would look like with smart manufacturing? I guess right now is the idea is it's like, um, it's not... Inter all interconnected, so it's hard to see real time flaws in the system, right? So you have to be you have to be an observer at the site to kind of see it or to see like the end product. Yeah, you'd walk me through. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not that black and white because okay. I guess it uh, there are some very advanced companies out there who who are leading that field. I, I would mention Siemens, for example, or right. GE are of course right. at the the leading edge of that, um, and they are not just leading on. Um, on, on, on the uh, visibility, uh, visualization part, but also the data analytics would come into play and the sensors. And, and of course, for their products, it makes sense. When it's like aerospace products, you, you need the best materials. Money is not that much of an issue when it comes to, to quality and uh, safety and, and, and the other. They're going to pay aspects. top dollar. Exactly. Plus your SpaceX. And when we, when we go on the other end of the spectrum, the small five people manufacturing shop here in, in, in West Virginia, um, they have totally different problems. They have uh, equipment that's a little older, it's more manual, it's not that connected because they build specialized uh, parts for mining operations, for example, or as a supplier for whatever, like a Toyota in a, in a small scale. Right. Um, and, and we had that discussion quite a bit is that they said like, hey, smart manufacturing, we understand what it is for the Toyota and the Mercedes and the Siemens and the GE and the Teslas. We fully understand why they need it with the robotics and the connectivity and the automation. But for us, we, we don't have like this batch sizes. We don't have uh, that specialty products. We don't see what the application is. And then when you when you go deeper and say like, hey, you can visualize this one machine that gives you trouble or that one product, uh, that one part of your process that that you you basically lose money over, and um, then then all of a sudden they say, oh, okay, I understand. Um, let me give you one example here in uh, in near Wheeling. Uh, there's Eagle Manufacturing. Oh, I'm one. from Wheeling, and oh. I've been to Eagles Manufacturing. Well, then you know like uh, 200 around 200 uh, 200 people uh, Joe Eddy great great guy uh, very very visionary so he he was a, a great person to interview and we looked at their their operation and they showed us what they did because they had a problem with their boiler like steam that you needed for their their production and sometimes the their boiler cooled down overnight because there was some kind of a problem and the, the automated system for safety shut it down so it cooled off in order to to have steam it, it uh, took two hours to to bring it up, uh, up to temperature um, and when the people came, the first shift, I, I think it was seven, six, seven in the morning, I don't know the exact time, they came and the boiler was cool. So basically they had to wait. They had to wait two hours until the boiler was on temperature to start the shift and production. And two hours, there were, I don't know, 100 people standing around doing nothing, right? Yeah. Well, not doing nothing, but yeah, like they're not you. productive. Waiting, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not what they're supposed something. to do. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Not as, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so what they did was basically a very simple, for, for, 
comparably little money. They installed their own system where basically the, the boiler, when it uh, experienced a problem, it sent a simple text message to the, the, the maintenance uh, chief and he could come in two hours early, fire up the system, and when the shift arrives, they can start production. Very simple, very clean, but that's, that's what smart manufacturing is. Basically, they used uh, connectivity and, and uh, technology to, to improve their processes. What about smart technology in our houses? Like, is there a way, like, I know, like, I've had a, I've lived in a house, and I guess, is this strictly IoT? I don't know, you explain it to me, but uh, I had, like, a, a Nest temperature gauge, and I had it hooked up to my phone, then I had Philips Hue bulbs linked up to my phone, then I had Alexa linked up in a camera. You know what I mean? And it's all on my phone. And I got it linked up so that, um, it, Props to my friend, actually, shout out Jimmy. Uh, I would, he set all this up. So I would be driving home and I'd, it would be reading my GPS location and I would strike the geofence that I have set up and then it would start heating up the house so that, you know, it has like a five mile radius. So by the time I get in the door in the winter, it's already warm. Yeah, that, that's that's a, a great application of the Internet of Things. Um, and I have exactly the same setup. And, uh, of course, it doesn't work as it's advertised uh, most of the time. <laughs> but, but if it works, it's very impressive. And then you feel very good. But then otherwise, you basically have to put the hard switch because this one bulb always turns on again. It's it's a new technology, so we're still learning, and uh, of course there's different standards. Do you have it? it do hard. you have it really set up though? Like, do you have it so like in the morning you wake up and there's like, well, I'm I'm guessing. Never mind. I mean, you probably have a wife and you're waking up at, at different times, whatever. But for me, at I least, have a baby. I wake up a lot. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So from my perspective, I would put like green lights on there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'd be having them flash like yellow, red, green to wake me up in the morning with music playing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, that that would be possible. I don't do that because I'm normally awake before my alarm rings. But yes. Oh man. Okay. Not voluntarily. Not voluntarily. Yeah. Oh, the baby. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this makes. Me... Hopefully, I'm a long way from there, but. We'll see. Who knows, man? Life. It's wonderful. So, yeah. Shout out to Dominic. Shout out to Dominic. All right. So, I have a good one here for you. It's something that I'm really, truly clueless about. And it's um, along the lines of research. I looked uh, online at your website and I just saw some of like, the, I don't know the right wording, some of the research papers you've read through or been on a board for. I have no idea like how wrote. this works. <laughs> wrote. Okay. You've wrote numerous papers. I think I also read that you were... Um, you got congratulations for being cited on Google on over 100 pages through Google uh, Scholar. Is that right? So I saw that. Uh, that was cool. That's probably one of the lower of your achievements here. Um, you had like 26,000 views on one of your um, papers that you wrote. Oh, man, I'm ignorant on this. I looked briefly. <laughs> but the general idea here is that um, what what? so you write a paper. What is the point of, of quote, unquote, writing a paper? Like I'm, this oh. is what I'm saying where there's a big gap. Like I think if I once again I went and uh, surveyed all these kids um, – that most of them would be like, yeah, I don't know what writing a paper does. Like, I don't, okay. I don't get it. You know what I mean? Like, what's yeah. the point of it? Who, who's judging it and saying, yeah, this paper's right, or no, it's just you've messed up somewhere. Okay, let me answer that in two parts. One, why we write papers is basically well to get the word out, right? do good things and talk about it. And when you do good things and it fails, still talk about it so others don't have to waste resources to do the same thing. Based on your research, research yeah, right? you, you basically communicate research achievements or, or research that you have done, the results of your research. You try to to communicate to the rest of the the community, the research community in your field, uh, and then slowly you push the state of the art and and basically contribute to the body of knowledge so in the end there's different ways of, of creating new knowledge like pushing the boundary of knowledge and then when, when just you know about it what's the benefit to humankind or to, to the, your community like you you would not be recognized on a selfish basis but also others could not build on your work and basically move on like uh, yeah okay so so and yeah, then yeah. the process of writing a paper is okay you have to do the experimentation you basically generate this new knowledge this new insight that others didn't have before however you do that there's a variation of ways to do that then you write your paper and then you submit it to a journal or a conference uh, where then your peers are invited by an editor to say okay look at this check it is it correct and there's, again, different ways. Sometimes you, your name is revealed. So that's a single blind peer review where they know, okay, who wrote it. And they still go through it. They're anonymized. So you don't know who judges your paper. Normally it's three to four people. Um, they look critically at your paper, often very critically, and then try to find flaws and address them. Then either your paper is rejected when they say, oh, it's not good, then the papers. Yeah. People have equivalent academic status as you like yeah. PhDs yeah people who are also in the known field, in the like, field yeah, right exactly. so if you wrote a, so what was one of you say it again what was one of uh, your research papers uh, that machine you learning and manufacturing machine learning example. and manufacturing so 
people also around that field um, review your thing and say, give it a check mark, like, yeah, yeah this makes sense. This exactly. actually aligns with what we are seeing. Yeah. And that can go through multiple rounds, saying like, oh, in this point here, I think this is not well explained. This doesn't make sense to us here. Some work is needed. Then that would be called major revisions, where you then can go back, address it, send it to them again, and they check it again. Is this a peer-reviewed journal? Is exactly. that what this is? Yeah, that's okay. peer review. So there's there's blind peer review, where you basically um, see they see your name, but you don't see the, the reviewer's name, because otherwise yeah, right, that would be a right. problem, because the communities are small. Oh, man. And then there's double blind, where basically they don't see who published the paper to really have a level playing field. Which is probably the most uh, fair, I guess. Yes and no. It's the most common one. But, but they have to know. Like They didn't have to know who's working on yeah, what. Yeah, the problem is when you build up on, on previous work, it's very hard to distinct, like to not know who does yeah, that. Like if yeah, if I see that yeah. you have, you're doing something in IoT or something in this specific version of it, and then I see a continuation yeah. of so, it, yeah, yeah. The, you, you'd have to try to, like your name is removed, and, and some journals insist that you don't cite to your previous work, but right. it's still hard. Like it's Sometimes yeah. you can still guess, but you won't know. Yeah. Have a but the intention philosophy. is very good, because then, then the intention is just the quality of the work is judged, and not not the fancy name that's behind it or the fancy university or, or something like that. Right. So you let's just uh, let's build on this little structure we have going. So you're say you're a um, professor who's doing research. Do you have do you naturally just have people under you helping with the research, or well, how does it work? Well, uh, normally you have a team of grad students, postdocs, undergrads, and and uh, then you you design your your research project. And normally you have objectives, and then you find out something interesting. Um, that's worth publishing, then normally you encourage your, your team and work with your team to, to develop a, a structure and then gradually go through different rounds internally to, to develop the paper. Boom. That's the bomb I wanted to drop. That's exactly it. Because what happens is that's the research portion that like I didn't know about growing up. Like all these professors, they want, they like choose, right? Is that how it works? Or you like, well, maybe that's not how it works. The idea is that say I'm applying for grad school, right? And I want to get a master's um, and do research under a certain professor, right? Does that professor play a role in me getting into grad school like uh, they get to choose like like these people have similar gpas right i know this person does good work whatever whatever right uh i'd prefer to have them on my research uh, how does that play that, that depends like it's it's uh, depends on the university the department and uh, the culture and in, in a certain field but yes uh, when you have a professor who who uh, vouches for you that that carries a lot of weight okay yeah so there's many more variables in the process yeah. but that that yeah. carries a big part of it okay that makes sense so if someone explained that to me coming in freshman year i wouldn't have just said ah screw the gpa third out the window you know what i mean i didn't realize that you had to have a good gpa in order to get into grad school and i didn't even yeah. know what the point of grad school was yeah. right so if all for two or three years i was like who cares about getting a good gpa i was like you just make you just you just meet the threshold of, the, of wherever you want to go and yeah, i was like very, you, you yeah. toss the rest out the window yeah. otherwise it would be a waste of resources right yeah no exactly more than needed yeah thank you yeah see that was my that was my vision so <laughs> i'm glad you changed a little bit and understand that there's value in doing more than needed oh not in time not not in time trust me i'm uh, trying to end the hiring process right now it's yeah. not didn't it's change never in time. too late like my my high school grades were really bad I have to admit that. And then the army turned me around. So, yeah. Oh, uh, I saw that. You went, so you went to the army uh, in Germany. Yeah. I'm an I'm a, uh, officer there. Yeah. An officer there. I saw that. Wow. What was that like? Um, I, I you did that after? It. Like, after? Yeah. Normally, like back in the days when I, I graduated from high school, 2001, um, it was mandatory for all male citizens to, to go for nine months uh, in, in the army. Um, and so I, I had to do that. Um, and it was actually the Monday after our prom that I had to be in the barracks. So we did that and I loved the first three months, the basic training, because it was awesome. Outside so was work, this so before it, college then? Oh yeah, okay. directly after high school. Okay. You can, yeah, you can push it, but yeah. It was I, required to go. Yeah. Gosh, it shows my political ignorance right now. Okay, so you had <laughs> to go. It's not anymore, so they changed that. Okay. Uh, so the first, it was for nine months. So I went for the original nine months. But what were your feelings towards that? Like, it was probably a normal thing at the time. Everyone was like, oh, go do oh, my time. Happy to be done with high school and have have that checked off, and so I thought, okay, well, that's a good good time to uh, reevaluate what I want to do. Um, and then after three months, the first basic training was really boring because I mean, yeah, what do you do, right? There's a, a lot of soldiers and not much to do, and uh, thank God, peace times. Um, so yeah, I was actually uh, in basic training when 9/11 happened, so that was kind of like okay. Then it was at the brink of you, you didn't know. So That's we, scary. We were, we were in the barracks and didn't go home with everything packed. So it was we were NATO, so we were, we were allies, and it was yeah, and there's an attack. You you have to be ready. 
But after that, anyhow, I'm, I'm getting derailed. No, again. no, no. That's scary uh, though because you um, you like for the most part, it's probably I'm not not a good historian, but for the most part, like in the time that you were enrolled, right, or in the several past groups of people who were enrolled, there was probably no craziness going on so for the most part it was serve your time and get out or my uh, well after the iron curtain was was fallen down i mean my dad was in the in the forest uh, for for i think eight weeks when the prague uh, uprising was um, he was in a paratrooper so yeah they they were ready to go and fight the russians when they come but then after the iron curtain and everything was a little bit more relaxed uh, yeah it was more stable was, yeah it was more stable um, but yeah, after that, basically, it was very boring to me. And, and then I thought, okay, what could I do? I, then I decided to, to enroll for, for officers training. And for my personal development, that was a, a big step because all of a sudden I was responsible for a group of recruits. And uh, you had to deliver because they were yeah, reliant on you. And, and that, that it was that change of mindset that I needed and uh, that push that I needed. And what and a feeling that is. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. And then you were, what, 18 at the time around yeah. there? Wow, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. So um, swinging back around here to something that we were starting to touch on earlier and I didn't want to just jump into it out the gate, was uh, we started getting this idea of big data, right, of, of IoT and being able to collect all this information at one time, right, and um, working it into our system and making conclusions, drawing insights based on it, and then changing you know, our, our manufacturing process or making immediate changes to um, help stabilize the system. But... What I'm interested in is something along the lines of big data and this idea that that companies are feeding on data right now, right? Like Google, like all these big companies. I know we're straying away from our expertise here, but hey, you got to have fun yeah. sometimes. Uh, so these big companies are, are collecting all this data on us, right? And I've, I've been, call me a conspiracy theorist here, but I've been on the route of their they're listening to us. Like I don't, and I've watched 150,000 <laughs> videos on maybe why they're not maybe why they're not listening to us from computer scientists, right? Mm -hmm. I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. And I've heard all their explanations, but I swear to you, I have never Googled Python in my entire life or anything until a year ago in the car with my friend. Next thing I know, Python's just getting blasted all over my phone <laughs> through advertisements, through all these things. And I've done research on why that could possibly be. On like, I'm put into a, a peer group of people, right? And they might all be at the time Googling Python. And since I'm in their advertising group, been lumped into their group through these companies, now they're hitting me with advertisements thinking that I might be in that group, right? And now they're using machine learning and stuff to figure out, oh, maybe he's not part of that group, whatever, whatever. But my point here is, is that I'm starting to think it might be better if our phones are listening to us. So <laughs> follow me on this. What if we found a way to own our data to a point like Apple is constantly, it turns our phone on, so it listens to us all the time. It now like draws conclusions based on the conversations we have and puts us into different advertising groups and puts it into a folder so that we have we own that folder of data and no one else does and we can sell it. Um, that's actually an interesting point of view and and uh, you're not so far off what people are actually playing around with. I'm saying playing around with doing research on right um, because uh, in I, I just had that conversation with uh, with the uh, the the C CTO, no, CIO of UCLA, Jim Davis. He's okay. uh, the lead behind the Smart Manufacturing Initiative um, out of LA, uh, where WU is also part of. Uh, and we interviewed him for the World Manufacturing Forum's report. And uh, he mentioned that um, one perception change that will come and, and is already coming, because when companies now negotiate contracts, there's always a data portion. That was not there before. People are aware data is, is something important, okay? Well, it's the difference is that people are aware now. Before it yeah, was like there exactly. was this line this of ignorance. awareness is there, but now... Bury it in somehow. We, we don't have a, a business model that, that corresponds with that. So we don't know... There's no, no dollar value attached to data yet. We know it's worth something, but owning your data, when nobody wants to buy it, it's, it's kind of like, okay, it costs you money to curate it and just, uh, just have the servers that run and, and store it. Um, so that will take time, uh, but people are working on to see like how could that be? You have more control over your data. You you benefit from your personal data, and so you say, hey, I, you're basically already selling your data and get a benefit from it. We're just you, trading right now, selling of, the data for. Your, do you use the Kruger card? Yeah. Yeah. You trade your data for a discount. You're basically getting paid for your data. That's that's how it works. I never thought of it in terms of. The Kroger card, but that's sure. a Why very. Why do you think they do that? That's a they very. They want to know what you personally buy, um, when you buy it, how often you buy it. I, I have a Kroger card, and 
Kroger don't listen, but I never registered it because I don't want it associated with my name, but I pay with credit card. So basically they have that anyways, even so I feel very, very smart and like a spy that I use it incognito. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You're like manipulating their data sets based on what you want. That's what I about. believe, but I think I probably didn't outsmart them, but it ah. still makes me feel good, so I don't want to think about that. That's <laughs> so funny. And yeah, no, you're right, right. Data's being collected 24-7. I think a lot of people are starting to understand that more. Um, Engineers, especially, just because we, you know what I mean, we work on the back. Oh yeah, end of the shop it. floor is a different story. And and let me give you one one yeah. tiny example because you Please. said Google and we derail. We don't derail. Google might go into that field at one point because they're really good at what they do: analyzing data, finding patterns, drawing conclusions, automated. So scalability is there. They don't need the human element that much in their process, which is great for for their business. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and we talked to a smaller company, uh, and in Germany, there's a lot of uh, small. Uh, companies that have a certain product where they're the leader in the world that nobody else can compete with. So they have their niche. They do that extremely well, highly priced products. But for example, um, in, in theaters, it red velvet curtains. Right. There's one company in the southern part of Germany who builds these. Because who else would do it? Of yeah. course, of course. Um, so to get into that market, high end money, not such a big, big issue. Quality is the issue. They they have that niche and they own it. So and and that works for for they're family owned. So they have a long perspective. They 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 do that very well. We talked to one company manufacturing. I think it was saw blades, like specialized uh, diamond coated saw blades for special applications. And I said, okay, so you have some. Of course, they have quality issues. Every manufacturing process can be improved. Otherwise, industrial engineering would kind of be out of a job. Yep. And um, so we thought, okay, we could do, we can collect data, analyze it, and then understand what we can do better, how we can improve the process, where the real problems in the process are to then target them and, and improve. And the guys said like, oh no, we don't want the data digitally available. I said, oh, why not? I said like, well, right now I'm paying my people very well. I treat them extremely good. They're kind of like my family. They work here till they retire. They're excellent at their job. They take pride in the product. Um, so, so we're the only ones who have that. Once I collect the data, nobody can guarantee me that nobody gets access to that data because there's always a breach. And, and you, you know, once it's stored, somebody might access. It. So many bridges, so yeah. many. You let you let WhatsApp get your. I, mean, I don't want to say WhatsApp because they're clearly owned by a bigger company, but I'm saying any random app that you don't know is owned by a bigger company. They're like trading some monetary money so that they can stay afloat. Some startup might be trading all their data. As long as the, data, the app is free, they have to earn their money some way, and then you're the product. Yeah. And you don't even know that they're selling it to this company, that company. So you're getting Facebook ads, but you're like, I don't even use Facebook. I use, I use like this random app. But like they're still getting the data somehow. No, but, but coming back to the, the manufacturing example, right. even so, they would store it on their own servers. I mean, there can always be a breach. Once the data is digitally available, there's no 100% guarantee that nobody can access it. Yeah, well, wait, what about the storing on their own servers, though? I mean, is that what you just, like, yeah. I'm confused about that. If, if they collect the data and store it on their own server, where's the, where's the, f- in that. No, they're not necessarily, but there is a potential because somebody oh. could go with the USB stick and that he was a little paranoid. But they don't even want to. They don't even want to do that. No, they didn't want to do that because he said, "Well, then the company we have no expertise in, in machine learning and, and pattern recognition and so on. So we might learn a little bit, but another company who gets access to that data, however, okay, um, they they are experts in machine learning and, and, and pattern recognition. They use the, the fancy new neural networks to to try to find the little bits and pieces and learn about our process." And then they don't have to pay their people a fair fair salary. They can produce somewhere in a country where the, the environmental legislation is very different. So all of a sudden they can produce the same or even a better product or close to that, that quality of that product at a, a much lower margin. And that would jeopardize their, their market standing. Yeah, it's almost as if like the downside, he's clearly looking at it as like, yeah, it's he just better very, if I very, don't very, even. Very, because he did that for like 30, 40 years. He right. was uh, the patriarch, like family owned. But um, so that that's one extreme. I, I don't, I, I we try to argue him out of it and say like, hey, we can take repercussions. But when you've missed that train, at one point you will get in trouble because others might get ahead. And I love that you just said that though, because that's really like, I think students or a lot of people in general, just people coming out are like, yeah, companies need to innovate and get ahead and this and that. And we say it almost blindly as if like we don't under- really understand it. We're just like, yeah, get ahead of the curve, this and that. Yeah, it's it's not like just you don't just do it to do it. It's like there should be a purpose behind it. And, and oftentimes or always there's a resource constraint. Like you have that many people who could be free to do innovative research in your company, collaborate with universities or or basically you could pay others to, to help you with your, your innovative projects. 
but you have to choose because you cannot do all put out all the fires or invest in all equally so there has to be some strategic uh, decision made to say okay hey that's our priority and that's where we have to invest a certain amount that will make a difference because when you just use your your sprinkler and and put a little bit of effort in everything you will not get ahead because then that's not not enough to to do anything that's meaningful right right now that makes sense i have to <clears throat> before we wrap up here i have to ask just because like you're already sitting here what's your thought and you're you're into manufacturing you're deep in it what's your thought on all this uh all these fireworks going off around uh, the whole Tesla and the whole Elon Musk thing, right? Because he's kind of being, I think, uh, net, I think it's positive just because engineering is getting so much of a of a exposure to this, right? It's kind of like a rock star thing in a weird way. Like the idea that he's making, he's making these things, even though it might be a persona and PR and them boosting his like look up, you know? What do you think about their actual like manufacturing side of things? Like do you like they're I think they're held back right now, right? They're like really behind in production on the cars. And Actually everything. when you would have been in my class last year, uh, I we started when they said the Model Three, they want to automate everything. Every every week I put a headline out and said like we will see. We will see. We will see. Because uh Tesla is in my opinion is not a car company, it's a technology company. So they come from it from the startup perspective. And I mean, the car companies for a reason, they do things how they do it. I mean, they can improve and they can innovate. They can change a little bit, of course, too, because it's not that's not the only right way to do it. But to scale up production and keep the quality and, and uh, have this tech times, that's that's not going overnight. And, and Tesla did realize that at one point and hired a lot of senior people from Mercedes from and Mercedes had a stake in Tesla. I think so far Mercedes is one of the only companies who made money with electric cars because basically they made a lot of money when they sold their stock in Tesla. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. I never even I never even thought of it that way. But yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty clear that they will run into trouble, and uh, especially with their their high percentage of automation, because there's the cognitive automation and there's the, the physical automation, and they when they they focus on their physical automation to try to to yeah make the process more reliable. Um, you you need to consider that automation is not a self fulfilling prophecy. Like it it needs maintenance. It needs to be planned. It needs to to be effective. Um, and and they underestimated the human element. And I think that's why I always refer to an older uh, definition of smart manufacturing, where they they emphasize the human ingenuity. That's an essential part of smart manufacturing. Like it's not to replace the human off the shop floor, like the yeah the the workerless shop floor that was a vision in the in the nineties. Uh, that's not what what I believe should happen first of all and second of all will happen because uh, humans are very good in certain things that machines are not and when we can bring them together that both can play their strengths to the full potential that humans are freed up with manual tasks of i don't know find a little mistake in in the in the data we can automate that so they can do something innovate think about the process on a bigger picture think about problem solving um and and all of a sudden you have a system that that improves over time and and basically works like a well-oiled machine Wow. Yeah. I just think of it as machines are taking over. Well, no. Uh, you should read, uh, read the Dominion post last December where we clearly said that will not happen. So. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm siding with the, uh, with the newspapers here. Yeah, I mean, I think they just post a lot of stuff just to get, pe- get those views up and get the people around. And, and I mean, there's data. like they, That was always a fear. I mean, you, you're in my class, and I hope you were there in that lecture where we talked about the first industrial revolution. Mm, where the <laughs> low chance. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> where the cloth makers basically, um, they, they re- uh, revolted because the machines took over their jobs but when we think over time um, we work more than ever and uh, it's the jobs change but but we now have like uh, three cars instead of one I know that's not the immediate worry right but what about like the more long-term thought because I've heard some other people speak on this right just through YouTube videos and stuff just popular ones nothing deep right and they talk about like this is where we get into this political talk of um, oh man my political side right is showing work or no the idea of a uh, universal um, uh, like income. people, yeah. yeah, right, right. And they, they're talking about it, and you know what I mean on uh, on these platforms and forums, right? Usually, where it shows up before ten years down the road, we start thinking about it. So, like, is that just talk, or I mean, what's the what's the reasoning for that then? Well, uh, the the thing is, the jobs will change, as I said, um, and the jobs will be more demanding mentally and less uh, physically. So there are, of course, portions of, of the society that probably does not want to or is not capable of, of fulfilling these jobs education-wise or, or uh, yeah, capability-wise. Um, and, and then uh, some portion of the, the, the society will kind of like be left behind. 
Um, and and I think it's a responsibility of a society to to somehow find a way to to give a purpose to these these people, and that that could be um, a general income. Um, so they could um, use that time for social work or, or working with in their communities and so on. There's a lot of things that can be done, and we know that. Um, I have a very distinct opinion about this this uh, <laughs> general income. Um, I think in theory it's a great idea that, to say, okay, give people responsibility and the freedom to do what they want to do. Um, I just in in the U.S. it might work a little better than in in the in the more uh, socially oriented uh, European countries. Um, because there it would be okay when somebody is irresponsible and gets that monthly income, right. which is there to provide shelter, food, medication and all that, but what they need. And it should be enough for that. Um, but when they decide on the first day to, to blow it out in a bar uh, and then they, they would die of hunger, then the society would jump in. And that's where the, the flaw will come in. Because then all this, this uh, in savings that are, are anticipated say, oh, we don't need health insurance because everybody will have that. Oh, we don't need social workers because everybody yeah all the ideas you need that yeah. and it's then just it, it just adds up on the cost so yeah so the thought is that if if a certain percentage of people do this and we see that percentage rising as a result like just mm -hmm. hypothetically if that was the case now we have to look at it and say well there's still something we need to do right and now we're exactly. kind of back in the same yeah. boat because you can't you cannot morally let somebody die of hunger even right. so it's their their fault so to speak but yeah yeah that's, that's it's not as easy it's works. not as so, easy as how it seems yeah. in theory it seems very straightforward and it's a great idea but uh, a lot of great ideas uh, had to face reality at one point and uh, yeah <laughs> this is a that's a great point and uh, i think we're coming to the end of our time here so i just want to thank you for coming on here and you're very knowledgeable and I wish we could have got to more of your research, but, <laughs> but I was afraid we were going to go over this time too much, but um, definitely glad to have you on. Dr. Woost, what's your Twitter? Because I know you're active on Twitter. Well, it's my first name and last name, but I probably have to spell it out because my first name and last name are not that usual. But. I'll put it up here on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Right. And um, if you're listening to this by podcast, let's go ahead and hear the spelling of it. <laughs> Wonderful. It's T-H-O-R-S-T-E-N-W-U-E-S-T. All right, so, at Thor Like Wooster. the God of Thunder, Thor. Yeah. God of Thunder. Okay, all right. And thank you very much for coming on here. I'm sure you'll be back on in time as long as you accept because you have a lot of interesting views and um, I'm sure there's some world scenarios that will play out that you'll enjoy coming back and talking about. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much for having me. All right, everyone. This is the Black Tees and Engineering Podcast. I think this is episode eight. I'm not sure. Tune in next time. I have Dr. Gall from the West Virginia University MAE department coming down and we're going to talk about being a pilot.